But thank you all for joining us for Boston's Haymarket and the Market District with Historic New England. We're joined by Historic New England's Ken Torino for a presentation on the past, present, and future of Boston's Market District from its earliest days when peddlers with carts sold produce around the town to today's market, which includes halal butchers, artisan cheesemongers, and Cambodian fruit sellers, Haymarket hosts an ever-changing and diverse population. Haymarket witnessed the central artery rise in the 1950s and retreat underground with the big dig in 2007. These obstacles have not, have not stopped the market from serving a constant stream of students and tourists, longtime residents, and newly arrived immigrant families, making it a vital and vibrant part of the city. And so this presentation is led by Ken Torino, who's the manager of community partnerships and resource development at Historic New England, a faculty member of Tufts University's Museum Studies Department. Ken teaches reimagining historic house museums. Ken's most recent publication is Reimagining the Historic Home Museum, New Approaches and Proven Solutions. And he is also currently working on a book on interpreting Christmas at historic houses and museums. And Ken also serves as president of the House of Seven Gables Settlement Association. So hopefully all or most of that was current, Ken. Uh, so all 140 of us or so, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Ken for joining us this morning. And Ken, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you, Robert. And uh, thank you for having me back. And uh, I just started with a few slides of Historic New England. I know you have speakers from uh, our organization regularly. I will just say that we are the largest regional heritage organization in America. We own these buildings plus uh, about a million artifacts and a million uh, documents, photographs, and so on in our library and archives. Um, so with that, I hope you will visit some of our properties. Uh, I think we've got a great time to be talking about this today because everyone's got food on their mind with uh, Thanksgiving uh, just days away. Um, I'm gonna jump in and talk to you about Haymarket and the Market District. This came about with a project that we did at Historic New England for over a year where we conducted oral histories and working with Justin Goodsteed, photographed, documented the market. Um, and that uh, resulted in this book that you can see here, Haymarket, uh, part of the Arcadia Images of America series. We also did a film, which you can watch on our website, uh, Historic New England's website, and uh, a documentary um, and photograph exhibition and so on and so on. So I'm gonna just dive into this. Now today I wanna show you how the market district has evolved over time in Boston. Boston being one of the major cities in the United States and one of the earliest. Um, and it follows a pattern that was very typical of what was going on in England. So Boston's earliest settlers were served by peddlers with carts going about the town selling produce and meat. Boston's first outdoor produce and meat market was established around what you're looking at here, this very early drawing of the town dock. I hope you can see my cursor here, town dock. That, um, and if you know Boston, Ann Street is now North Street to give you a location. So Boston's first outdoor produce and meat market was established right here, the chief place for trading and storing goods. If you know downtown Boston or been on the Freedom Trail, it's near the present site of the Sam Adams statue on the west side of Fannel Hall. So that also will show you how Boston is a city that has evolved and been filled in. Now, what you're looking at is a rendering of the Boston's first townhouse. It was a purpose-built town hall and colonial seat of government from 1658 to 1711, when it was destroyed by one of Boston's many fires. Now, the reason I wanted to point this out, I think you'll know the location. Again, if you've been on the Freedom Trail and you know where the old state house is, that is where this building stood. The first floor though, is what I want to point your attention to. It provided a shelter for merchants who had previously used the, uh, the location as an outdoor market. The upper floor 
uh, was divided into rooms for civic and religious purpose. So the outdoor market was here covered. Now that is very much in line with the European tradition you can see here. Uh, this is a French market that survives um, from the uh, early, uh, actually 18th century. And here you can see it's covered, but it's an outdoor market. So the settlers in Boston are following those uh, patterns of what they were used to. Merchant Peter Fennell offered at his own expense, quote, to erect and build a noble structure or edifice to be improved for a market for the use, benefit, and advantage of the town. This is Fennell Hall erected in 1742. But you know, it wasn't a success at first. Vendors were slow to rent. Um, again, this was, I should tell you, open air at the bottom of the original Fennell Hall. And this wooden uh, structures you see were actually for outdoor vendors. Now, um, the second floor was used for bib business and public meetings. Now, this building would be destroyed, guess what, in a fire from 1761. It was rebuilt in 1763. And then again, in 19, oh, excuse me, 1805, the famous architect Charles Bilfinch doubled its height and width, adding a third floor, new bays, and uh, open, the open arcades were enclosed. Um, and this is an early image we have. Here is another one uh, that shows you Fennel Hall. And when Bullfinch did that, he uh, used the top floor for civic meeting spots. The fourth floor is maintained today by the ancient and honorable artillery. So just to show you this interior view. So again, like those earlier markets, the upstairs was for public use and the downstairs was for selling um, produce and other goods. Now, Fennel Hall Marketplace followed in 1826. This was on land that was filled in um, by the city. This was conceived by Mayor Josiah Quincy and it was to relieve the crowded and unsanitary conditions in the market district with the peddlers and all. Over the course of three years, Quincy worked closely with the city council and the market committee to raise funds to purchase land and build out land for this market. That included, included acquiring wharves and filling in, as I mentioned, part of the harbor. Now, you can see the two buildings on the side, which are there today. This is North and South South Markets. And you can see uh, Fennel Hall in the distance. Now we all know this as Quincy Market. It's not, it's never been the name. Well, it's what we call it, many people. The official name is Fennel Hall Marketplace. People in Quincy's day wanted to name it after him and he declined. So the official name still is Fennel Hall Marketplace. Now, I mentioned Boston is a city that has been filled in. Back Bay, you would have heard of here, Mill Pond. As the city grew, there was need, need for more land. This map shows the Mill Pond, which we filled in in the 19th century and allow for an expansion of this market district. And let me show you, if you can see my cursor, I hope you can here, it says Mill Pond. So this is all land that would be filled in. Uh, and the market district would then expand from Fennel Hall um, over into what the Mill Pond area was. Blackstone Street, which is the center street for what we now know as Haymarket, um, was laid out by 1833. And uh, what happened that these buildings that were on that street originally faced the other way because what's now, what I'm showing you here, would have been the pond, the mill pond. So they actually moved the, the front to the opposite side on the new Blackstone Street. And you can see some of these early buildings here. They would have been, as I mentioned, three or four stories. They could be brick, they could be wood. Uh, so let me show you a few others here. 
Uh, this is from, this was published in 1852. Uh, according uh, to the 1850 census, Boston had a population of almost 137,000 people, making it the third largest city in the U US. And these people needed to get food. But the market district, here what I'm talking, Blackstone, you can see here, was made up of some businesses selling food, but I did a lot of work in the census and I did a lot of work with the directories. And I found that in 1861 of the 60 businesses in operation of the city, uh, manufacturers and stove dealers, and you can see Blackstone Street on their ads here, a third of them were located right on Blackstone Street. But that by 1877 would change. There would only be 16 left as more and more businesses like this one catered to food and provision related businesses. This is an ad from 1902, 1903. And this company uh, advertised much goodness for little money and extracts and speci uh, specialities. Now, where does the name Haymarket come from? or what we now know as the outdoor market. Uh, so where it comes from is from Haymarket Square. Haymarket Square became one end of the market district, which ran from Fannell Hall and Faneuil Hall Marketplace along Blackstone Street to Haymarket Square. Now the name derives because it was one of the several locations in the city of Boston for selling hay. And you have to remember how important hay was uh, at this time period. You're using hay to feed animals, right? Horses, you can see them in this image. You're also using hay for mattresses. So hay was imported, not imported, brought into the city uh, and sold one of these locations being Haymarket Square. Now this is uh, from a popular uh, national magazine that was published in Boston called Blue's Pictorial. And the headline reads, quote, if the good people of Boston die of starvation, it will not be for the lack of well-supplied market houses, began this article. Uh, and it shows you this engraving with several of the marketplaces around the city. So it was, as the population grew, there were de demand for more neighborhood markets. Peddler, the peddlers, though, continued to roam the neighborhoods well into the 20th century. Now, let me give you an example of one of these local, um, other local markets. The Boylston Market opened in 1810 at the corner of Boylston and Washington Street. Street. This 18, uh, 1850 illustrations illustrates the very use of the building. I can tell you upstairs there was a tailor shop, there was a gymnasium and a market. While the vendors, you can see them, that are here outside. The peddlers sold their goods on the street. Uh, so a neighborhood market. Now I thought I'd throw this one in today uh, because we're all thinking, or many of us are thinking about Thanksgiving in Turkey. This was actually for Christmas, December 30th, 1865, um, at, from again, another national magazine, which shows people at the market, and you can see what they're all buying, the turkeys for the holiday feast. The majority of the whole, that's it. That is actually at uh, Quincy, what we call Quincy Market, Fennel Hall. That the majority of the wholesalers specialized in meat, like the turkey. According to the historian John Quincy Jr., the vendors at Quincy Market sold predominantly beef both wholesale and retail after the Civil War in this 1860s photograph. And here you can see from Palou's, Palou's Pictorial Drawing Room Companion, published in 1857, an illustration of South Market Street showing you the vendors outside. And just a little aside, this is an illustration by Winslow Homer. Uh, Pushcart and market vendors were allowed to sell their goods without any charge in the streets flanking the market. And this looks very calm, not the usual scene that you would, uh, would have uh, at Fennel Hall Marketplace. Uh, it would be more typical to see something like this. Uh, Fennel Hall um, was 
and Fennel Hall Market were thriving in the early 1900s when this image was taken. A 1910 pamphlet on the market stated um, that Fennel Hall has become not only a landmark, but a source of pride to our citizens, the site of three to 400 wagons loaded with fruits and vegetables, the hurly burly of the purchasers, um, and so on and so on, looking for bargains. Now, uh, when I was doing my research, I found these uh, draw, uh, photographs in the Library of Congress, and they're taken by well-known reformer and photographer Louis Hine of New York. He took this, these photographs I'm going to show you between uh, 1909 and 1917. Um, this is showing you the immigrants that were coming in. A 1904 article in the Boston Globe on the history of Boston's pushcart peddlers discusses the influ influx of immigrants from countries bordering the Mediterranean, particularly the Italians. The article describes how the peddlers went about selling their baskets of goods. Uh, and many of the immigrants and their children found work in this market district. And I want to show you some of these other Louis Hine images. He began doing this photography for the National Child Labor Committee, a leader proponent for child labor reform. After joining the committee, Hine wrote, my child label photos have already set the authorities to work and see if such things can be possible. What he's saying, you know, the, the bad condition that these children were working at. There were about 2 million children under 16 uh, in the workforce in the United States at the time uh, Louis, uh, Louis Heim was photographing these images and these all taken in Boston. Now there were child labor laws, but they were not enforced. He sought to publicize the reality of child laborhood, light labor by taking images such as this one. And, and this, here you can see children working, but you can also see that the market was frequented by people from all walks of life. There you see a maid in the forefront here. You have to remember, People needed at this time to have markets close at hand. Many people shopped daily because the lack of good refrigeration. At this time, you're having your ice boxes. Now, beginning in May 1899, regulations were enacted in regard to peddlers. Um, they were required to register and then were issued a number. Uh, the Boston Globe stated that Quote, these numbers will be of such size and style to be easily read. Now you can see right on this card, there's the sign, the name and number. Um, and the S. Romeo, whose name and number you see there, I found in the directories, uh, he was listed as a laborer living on Well Street, Boston. That was interesting. Citizens, U.S. citizens were given even numbered licenses. So he had to be a citizen. Odd number numbers went to non-residents, persons who are not citizens. That would be the new immigrants. And I love these images because they show you how busy the marketplace was. Vend vendors were setting up on the sidewalks and in front of shops with a wide variety of vehicles. This, along with pedestrians and shoppers, caused crowded sidewalk, sidewalks and traffic jams. Um, newspaper accounts to told of frequent encounters between the police and the vendors. Uh, in 1908, a law was enacted, enacted setting the market time to be held from 5 p.m. to 11 p.m. So at that time, again, it was an evening market. Just to show you how the market grew and popular it was, this is Blackstone Street. Uh, you can see uh, the, the tower in the back there, the Customs House Tower. This is 1921. And uh, you can see just market, you can see the horse-drawn wagons with vendors and just how crowded the shopping district could be. Chincamo Ruma, a Sicilian immigrant, uh, founded Rumor Fruit and Produce in 1900. Leslie Jones of the 
Boston Herald took this photo uh, in 1935 and uh, Ruma would arrive at 3 a.m. each morning to purchase his produce to later sell alongside the other meat, poultry, and produce uh, vendors. And I should say, you know, even at this time, these goods were inspected by the Board of Health in the 1930s. Um, this is the corner of Hanover and Blackstone, and you can see there were food vendors. This is from 19. 37. And the view is looking at, if you know downtown Boston today, what's now the Rose Kennedy Greenway, you can see here. Pushcarts would sell seasonal farm produce that came from far reaches of the United States. This is Quincy Market in 1937. Now remember what's key, this was seasonal produce. We're very spoiled today, and I'll talk more about that today. The 1930s and the Great Depression were hard on Fannell Hall and Fannell Hall Marketplace. Uh, many shops and businesses in the market district were closing and moving to other locations. Boston Arti uh, Globe article from September 1932 discuss discusses a decision by the Boston Market Gardeners Association to seek a change in location as the result of the growing congestion and general need for additional space. Uh, they were going to move to a more modern place. The last of these would not move out until the 1960s. So even on mar non-market days, again, Blackstone Street um, between North and Hanover Streets were busy. This is a photograph from 1945. And at that time, there were 51 businesses selling poultry and meat. Uh, this 1949 uh, image shows both sides of Blackstone Street looking towards north, north from Hanover. Uh, again, like the previous photo, a majority of these establishments sold meat. There were also several restaurants, tool and grinding company, two liquor stores, and one macaroni manufacturer. Remember, we're by the North End. This is Haymarket Square in 1945. And in the center, if you look carefully, you can see buses. It was a terminal uh, for the subway, uh, a bus terminal. And it was also, the, there was a subway ran streetcars um, under the Brattle Loop at Scully Square. This would change in January, 1967, when the platforms would be renamed Haymarket, still the stop we have today. In 1948, the Massachusetts Department of Public Works initiated the Master Highway Plan for the Boston Metropolitan Region, which included the building of the Central Artery. Now, what you're looking at is the demolition of one side of Blackstone Street. The story of Haymarket and the Market District is one of expansion and then contraction as the city grew and developed. Haymarket would constantly be under threat. And here you can see again, um, they're losing one whole side of Blackstone. So in the 1950s, one half was demolished by the Central Artery Project. Um, so you would lose half of the marketplace. Construction began on the Central Artery in 1953. And here's the causeway ramp officially opened in 1959. Now, this isn't one of the changes. This is only one of the changes that Haymarket and the Market District would be subject to. One had to do with something that was affecting the whole country. Uh, and that would also affect Haymarket. And that had to be the growing popularity of supermarkets and supermarket chain, chains starting in the 1920s. This ate into the popularity of the market. People had been coming in from the suburbs, uh, suburbs to get their produce at Haymarket, and some to this day still do. Uh, along with this was the growth of the automobile and the suburban developments after World War II. And you can see an ad for one of those grocery stores and what you could get there and note prices. Historian John Quincy 
described the marketplace in the 1950s, quote, as a dank collection of modified warehouse stores that gave off the unsettling odor of rotting fish, flesh, and fowl from uncontrolled trash. By the 1960s, wholesalers who had shops at Quincy Market and Fannell Hall had moved into the New England Produce Center, which was in Chelsea, which became the major distribution center um, in New England for all the produce that went to all the grocery stores, as well as Haymarket and the Market District. Now, by this time, Haymarket was made up of vendors and workers of Italian descent. Now, some may have had a reputation as being rude or selling overripe produce, but you just had to be, be picky. Um, and here we have some vendors I wanted to show you. This is uh, selling crab in 1956. Many vendors left after the construction of the central artery, but others survived. Here you're looking um, at uh, Blackstone Street, the half that survived, 1954. Um, that's when, the mid-1950s, the MIT uh, and Professor Kevin Lynch undertook a project called the Perceptual Form of the City. Haymarket has constantly been studied in national studies and master's thesis. Um, over the course of its lifespan, this being one of the first, and that is where these photos are from. I do want you to note that the wooden stands, which covered a portion of the sidewalk, this gave vendors who had shops more space for selling, um, and these would be filled on the market days. Now, according to historian Alex Goldfield, the construction, construction of the central artery a huge toll on the people of the North End, with many people losing their homes and livelihoods, while others have to put up with years of disorder. This pattern is going to be repeated again and again. This is uh, beneath the central artery. Now, I remember this. Uh, parked cars would come in the 1950s. They posed a huge issue for the city as be, uh, as the space beneath the expressway had few signs and no parking meters causing congestion and safety issues. Edward Crowley, writing in the Globe in 1948, comment, commented about public safety. He wrote, anyone who thinks they, they can force the public to use those underpasses is crazy. Now, um, also, something that Haymarket and the Market District had to contend with was urban development. Uh, what you're looking at is Haymarket Square. It had become a transportation hub here um, as the Eastern Massachusetts Street Railway, originally a streetcar company and later a bus company, was housed. Uh, it was taken over by the Metropol Metropolitan Transportation Authority, the MTA. Um, but what you're looking at here is the demolition of the West End, um, another neighborhood where Haymarket workers live. Many of them did. So again, they're getting these hits, Haymarket and the market district from all sides. Thus, uh, here you can see another image taken by Wendy Snyder between 1968 and 1969. She published Haymarket and was kind enough to let us use some of the photographs in the book that I did. And this was taken from the central artery and it shows the busy market at the corner of Blackstone and Hanover Street. The buildings there were changed. The building at the center of this image uh, originally had five stories. The top two were taken down to reduce the tax assessment during the depression of the 30s. Later, they would be put uh, put back on. Now, Gus Sarah here on the left uh, is seen with his mother, Anna, Anna, and his father, Manny. He remembers going to the market starting when he was six or seven. He's still going to the market. Uh, he, they sold string beans and tomatoes off a push cart. His family lived in the West End, which, as I mentioned, was destroyed. 
His grandparents were the first members of the family to work at Haymarket. Um, remembering his mother, Gus noted, she'd outsell anyone down there normally. Customers would come by and ask solely for her. Now, in 1974, pushcart peddlers and shop owners along Blackstone Street organized as the Haymarket Pushcart Association. Gus Sarah, by that time, a state rep from East Boston, son of the original owner you see here, became the first president for one year. Then Joseph Matero took over, uh, took over the association, succeeded, um, and he succeeded Sarah in 1975, and later Otto Galato, who you will see, Galato, would take over in March 2004, and he's still there to this day. Now this is taken also from the central artery and it shows you some of the Blackstone buildings that had been torn down. Um, and you can see to the left in the distance, uh, government center. This lot was used as a parking lot um, in, for city employees and by shoppers on weekends. Now um, at this time, the push cart stands paid $12 annually for a license and were assigned a certain spot. Uh, this was not always the case. Not long before this, push carts would line up at Fennel Hall. And according to a Boston Globe article of December 6, 1969, a, a policeman would blow a whistle and off they would go to claim a spot. Quote, predict that method caused wild fights and near riots. So there are markings on in the granite where your spot is today. So you don't go over it. Now, selling meat was a big business. Uh, between 14 and 17 sellers of meat used the shops along Blackstone Street, and another 11 and 12 along North Street between Union and Blackstone. Most were wholesale, um, uh, but the meat, wholesale deals, excuse me. Um, when the market ran on Fridays and Saturdays, uh, this was a really bustling business. These are all um, Wendy Snyder photographs. When she captured Professor uh, Isidore Edelstein with his push cart. Note the license in the front here, you can see, licenses issued. This is in front of the Coliseum restaurant at the corner of Blackstone and North Street. Wendy Schneider remembers the people at the market called him professor because when others made three to four dollars, the professor made 10. And it seems like everyone at the market then and continuing to this day has nicknames. For example, these are a few of them. Uh, Joe Bagman, Joe Bananas, Joe the Grape, Joe Tomato. Johnny Tomato, Polly Peppers, and so forth. A practice, as I said, that continues to this day. In the mid 1970s, much of then president of the Pushcarts Association, Matera's work, along with Gus Sarah's assistance, dealt with trash pickup at the market. Mayor Kevin White threatened to discontinue trash pickup at the market owing to its high cost to the city. With the aid of longtime Haymarket supporter, Councilman Frederick Langone, the Haymarket Pushcart Association of the city eventually re reached a compromise, which included regular trash pickup by the city. That meant raising license fee for the pushcart vendors to offset the cost of trash pickup. You know, people uh, seem to grow up at the market. Uh, Tutti Vuchella, uh, Vuchella Shelley on the left and his son, Frank, uh, at their stand at North and Market Street. At this time, Tuddy, Tuddy had worked at the market for 45 years, and his father had worked at the market for 30 years. Frank was, had, was just out of the military, and he began working at the market at nine or 10 years old. Um, and he was still working there up until just a few years ago. Uh, many of the people who worked there lived in the North End. Pat Panaccio was one of 10 from the North End. Uh, his brother, Frank, who you'll meet shortly, was also a market worker. Here's an image at, on a late Friday evening. One vendor commented, quote, Saturdays, the merchandise had been out for two days. And it was, if it was going to show any problems, it would show on Saturday. 
and we give it out Saturday night at ridiculously low prices. Still happened today. Now, if anyone in the audience frequented uh, Haymarket back in that time, 70s and so, uh, there was a walkway underneath um, the uh, central artery um, that connected market and um, the market to the north end. I remember that uh, vividly. Um, now, I want to show you a couple other people who worked there. This is Harry Diorsi. Uh, he began working at Haymarket with his brother Dick selling cold cut in the 1960s. Then he opened his own shop, Harry's Cheese, uh, in 1968. It moved to various locations, but then settled at 98 Blackstone Street, becoming a staple of the market. And here you can see Harry's cold cut cheese. Below the sign is his son, Ben's future son-in-law, Roy Fournier, who began working there part-time in the 1970s, and he's still there today. Now, this photograph is important because it also shows some other encroachment on the market. You can see the parking garage that comes in uh, there, um, and then in 19, this is 1988, this photo, then you can also see the Bostonian Hotel. The market still ran in front of and on the side of the market. That was a requirement. Now, the, this is what the market looked like before the next big change. And what's that next big change? The big dig. Um, the, that was the next challenge to the market, to depress the central artery. So what went up, right, has to come down. Uh, this would be the Thomas, Thomas P. O'Neill uh, Jr. Tunnel, known as the Big Dig, the central artery. The project also included the, the construction of the Ted Win Williams Tunnel, the Leonard B. P. Zakem Bunker Hill Memorial Bridge, and the Rose Kennedy Greenway. Construction took place between 1991 and 2006, uh, with the project officially ending on December 31, 2007. Uh, the market still operated on Friday and Saturdays, so they had to stop construction. It was part of the deal uh, during the life of the construction of the central artery, and it was stopped Thursday afternoons, allowing the vendors to set up their stands. Frederick Salvucci, Secretary of Transportation during the initial planning, worked with Gus Sierra to sustain the market. So here are some uh, photographs looking towards the corner of Sudbury and Blackstone Street, 1998. That year was the peak of big dig construction. New structures were planned and development of the former route of the central artery, including the building shown in the center at 136. Blackstone. This would become the MBTA's Haymarket subway station and the registry of motor vehicles. So again, the market is subject to all of this change, but does did continue. This photograph was taken by Peter Vanderwalk and, um, and showing you the construction going on. And this is in the year 2000. I get a couple of those. Now, I wanted to show you this because it's one of my favorite public sculptures in all of Boston. This was done at the market in 1976. Artist Mags Harris installed bronze pieces of trash at Haymarket. Um, and when, when the construction of the big dig happened, this had to be taken out and it was stored at the Museum of Science. And then when the central, when the central artery was depressed, um, this was put back in place and rededicated in 2006, and it's still there today. This is, this is what the market looks like at the end of the big dig. Uh, to the right, where you see those trucks, that's where the Rose Kennedy Greenway is today. Now, the shoppers, uh, we talked about Haymarket always being a place for immigrants to work, but it's also been a place for immigrants to get um, food that um, were needed. And Haymarket has continually supplied the most needy people in the city. It really was a meeting place because you would get people who worked at City Hall to come over. 
Um, I worked in the North End for a while. I would come over, students come over because you could get inexpensive, but still good quality goods, as long as you, you know, made sure you did. <laughs> the shoppers reflect the changing demographics of the cities when this photograph was taken in 1999. Now at that point, there's now yet another threat uh, to the market. But just to give you an image of you know, the diversity that you could find at the market still to this day. You still have some of the older Italian markets, um, uh, vendors, but you will also meet some of these characters. Um, in two, over two years, Justin Goodstein photographed, and I conducted, as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, oral histories with these workers and shoppers, and shoppers, I should say. We got to know them very, very well. The result was an online film series I mentioned and a documentary film, both of which can be found at Historic New England's uh, websites. Um, we documented the, the market in the course of one year. The market runs virtually in all weather, um, unless it gets to a certain temperature when they do call it off. The market still to this day goes up on a Thursday late afternoon and the vendors at that point, when we were documenting, would be packing their trucks and bringing them at 3 a.m. to the market from Chelsea, which was the wholesale dealer at that time. When everyone moved out of Banel Hall, this is where they moved. Um, and I just want to show you some images that Justin took over the course of the two years. I do want you to note this little triangle. I hope you can all see my cursor moving here, uh, just about in the middle of the photograph. Um, we're gonna talk more about that in just a minute. Earlier on in this slide presentation, I said, originally, you could only get produce seasonally. Well, as you all know, that has changed. Food coming in that we can now only got seasonally, maybe tomatoes, you get all year round now. You also, because of the expansion of markets and because of people's different food ways, you find some of the old timers of the market said they started seeing fruits and vegetables. They had no idea what they are because they were catering to different immigrant groups. Um, so today you can find things from all over the world. Uh, this is a contemporary image of Harry's Cheese and Cold Cut Center. For several years running, they haven't been won recently because of COVID. Um, this one, hands down, as the best cheese company in all of Boston. Um, as I mentioned, people spend their whole lives there. There you see Jesse Hole, uh, Holer as a young man on the left. He recalls skipping school on Fridays in the 1970s to work the market, making $35 for two days. Quote, we sat there all day with a bucket of water and wiped the dust off the oranges. I cleaned hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of oranges. The customers used to say, quote, are you supposed to be in school? And he used to say to them, nah, I got special permission to be down here. Well, we know that wasn't quite there you see him as an adult where he was working at the market until just a few years ago. Retired vendor Frank Pinaccio, you met his brother uh, just a few slides back, stops by every week uh, to help as needed, chat with friends, and grab a beer at Dirty Nelly's. He got his start at the market during World War II, living with his nine siblings in the North End. And here, some more East, uh, recent owners and immigrants. Hassan came to America from Egypt in 2008. He said a neighbor brought him to Haymarket. Uh, he got a job there as a worker and eventually got his own spot. He met his wife uh, in the background below his shoulder. That's Hassan on the left, I should have noted. Um, Miriam, a Moroccan in, immigrant there. Uh, and she often worked with them, helping out, uh, and now raises their children at home. Um, Sina, Alyssa Chim, came from Batabong, Cambodia in 1982 and began work, uh, working for Otto Galato at his stand. And later she worked at Harry's Cheese Shop. Sina says, I like to work outside because you see more of the crowd, more people. She said, I want to rent a shop for my kids. 
I got five of them. Uh, get to put them to work. Well, Sia got her own stand in 2014. And I should mention, many of these people, you know, this market runs on Fridays and Saturdays, have other full-time jobs during the week. And Sina, uh, for many years, was working um, at one of the stop and shops. Uh, COVID did a number on these people, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, Salim here owns a halal meat market. He came to America in 1988 from Beirut, Lebanon, and saw a need for halal markets with the changing demographic. Children have always worked at the market. I, I show you that just a bit, um, besides back, whether for pay or just helping out. Uh, they were often on cleaning duty, um, but everyone in the family was expected to help out. Now, this is Otto Galato, who is president of the Haymarket Pushcart Association, and he works closely to this day with cities, with the city on issues of development, trash collecting, and uh, with the owners of the 196 vendor licenses. Here's a uh, hay market at the end of the market after cleanup, which is required. Now, in 2015, the market expected another hit, but the support of the city of Boston and um, the Haymarket Pushcarts Association, you got your first new expansion in almost a century of the market district. And that's the opening of the Boston Public Market at 100 Hanover Street. This market is the only of its kind in the city selling uh, goods produced or originating in New England for sale. So the Haymarket Push Card Association really didn't know if this would have an impact, but it really didn't. Uh, it's very much different um, than what you get uh, at, the, uh, at the market. This only, has to be New England produce. So you're not gonna find pineapples being sold at this market. And you are only gonna be fi finding seasonal produce sold at this market. Now, remember I talked to you about that little triangle? Well, another hit. Um, this was a uh, proposals called for a luxury five to six story hotel. Um, with approximately 145,000 square feet. Otto Galato and the vendors work closely with the city and um, the owners of the hotel, which you see going up here on that little triangle. And this was a, another hit because the market vendors were going to lose their, where they kept their trash receptacles. And as part of the arrangement, these trash receptacles are now actually on the ground floor, the backside of the hotel inside. It also is supplying much needed restrooms to the market. So here it is being built and eventually completed. Um, but also as this is going up and here you see the finished, just about finished product of the hotel, the luxury hotel which is, is quite, quite beautiful. And this is the view from the Greenway uh, looking towards it. Um, but Haymarket, and here we have seen again, really uh, took a brunt with COVID. Um, and a lot of the market suffered again. It just seems like these guys and gals keep getting hit. Uh, I have to tell you, it is back. Um, the hotel is there. Um, Otto works very closely with the vendors and the hotel. Uh, the hotel provided new awnings, matching awnings from Italy and upgrades uh, to the street. This is still, still in, uh, in the process development. So in summary, Haymarket has always been a place, uh, the market for people in town and still many people come in from the su suburbs to get a good deal. It, it helps many of those most in need of this in the city for produce, as I mentioned earlier, and still to this day does. It's had a lot of hits. Um, the market district has expanded and shrunk to what we have today. Um, and I think there is a place in the city for these outdoor markets. Uh, there very much is a need in Boston for places like Haymarket.
market. So uh, I want to just say thank you for having me. If you have any questions, uh, you can put them in the, in the chat. And Robert's going to come back and will be uh, feeding me these questions if you have any. Thank you for your time. If you haven't visited Haymarket, uh, please do. So Ken, a uh, wonderful job. Uh, let's take uh, roughly 10 minutes of uh, audience questions. Uh, Joyce writes, I have always associated Haymarket with the uh, Azaroton, A-S-A-R-O-T-O-N, uh, art in the nearby sidewalks and roads. It's brilliant. Does historic New England include that art under any of its care and preservation responsibilities? Oh, excellent question. That is, thank you for that. That is the name of that piece that I, I talked to you that Mags Harris did in the street with the trash. Um, uh, ac actually, no. Historic New England is, does, has nothing to do with that, um, but it is under uh, the Haymarket Pushcart Association helps to maintain that. Um, what I would like to see is it be preserved by the preservation groups. I'd like to see us have a historic marker down there uh, to show why this is important. Um, but that's a good question. It is not. Like with many um, historic buildings that get put on our National Register for Historic Places, that's really honorific. Um, that does not mean that they can't be torn down. A lot of people don't understand that. I will say the Haymarket Pushcart Association and people in the city made sure during the big dig that that was preserved and came back. So I think there's a lot of hope for that. Good question. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks, what is the longest running family business at Haymarket? Oh, wow. That is an excellent question. I'm just going through my mind. Um, the uh, Harry's Cheese Shop, which is run by Roy, has been there since the 60s. I knew the Fuschella's shop had been there since the 60s. Um, I know someone we interviewed for the um, documentary, which you can watch online, and there's the uh, connection there on the slide, uh, was there in the 60s. So I, I, all I can say, I don't think there's any that precede the 1960s. But think of that. There have been people there their whole lives who are still working there since the 1960s. Uh, let's see here. Paula asks, how early in the market, uh, uh, I'm sorry, how early does the market open on Saturday morning? Well, it opens on Friday morning. It's Friday and Saturdays. And the vendors are setting up the tents, as you saw, on Friday, uh, excuse me, on Thursday uh, afternoons. And some of the vendors will actually open up if they've, if they're further enough along. Um, I've gone, I think five o'clock in the morning, the vendors, three o'clock in the morning, the vendors are there. Uh, I've gotten there like at six o'clock in the morning and they're open. Um, there's no set time. It depends on the individual vendors, but believe me, they are all open around six-ish in the morning. Uh, let's see. So Diane, I will, uh, I'll pass your message along to Ken. Uh, Karen says, thank you for this. Uh, can you say more about the 1960s MIT study? What was involved and uh, the impact on the market? Uh, actually, that's a, oh, these are the, these are just the greatest questions. <laughs> so that study that MIT done was between 54 and 59 with Kevin Lynch. And it was, I mentioned it was called the, the per, percept, excuse me, perceptual form of the city. And it was done with several researchers and photographers. Um, the research findings were the foundations of Lynch's theories on city planning discussed in this seminal work. It was actually a very important work in city planning. The study focused on the cities of Boston, Las, LA, California, and Jersey City. 
Um, so I do not think there was any direct impact on Haymarket, but it did have a direct impact on city planning and talking about how vital markets were into um, a livable city. Um, and if you think about that, think about the markets and in Pike Place Market in Seattle, think about the great markets in Philadelphia, markets in New York, um, the markets in London, which have shrunk and shrunk and shrunk, how important these are to urban living. But I don't think the book itself had an impact on Haymarket. I hope that, I hope that works. Uh, Paula wants to know, when is the produce marked down on Saturday? <laughs> uh, that, again, de depends on the vendor. But I can tell you, Saturday afternoons, the thing about it is, these vendors, if they don't sell the food that day, they some of it, like apples, can, they'll take back and they can store in their units for their use next week. But other things have to go. I mean, I bought, bought, this is a while ago, but you go late Friday afternoon and they will be selling things at, some of them will be selling things at a discount. So there's no set time. You, I would just say, if you're looking for those, like I've got boxes of plums, which I made into jam. I just went late in the afternoon, um, but you can get bargains really anytime during the market, but especially late afternoon on Saturday afternoons, that's where, some of this stuff, if it's not sold, they're just going to trash. Other things like apples or other fruits and vegetables, carrots, they can go back into their units, will just go back. Uh, Sandy asks, do customers today still barter with the vendors? Uh, that's, that's interesting. You know, in the past, because I, I used to go and I worked in the North End, um, they didn't even want you to touch the vegetables or fruits. Um, and now most vendors are letting, just about every vendor is letting you just pick, which is, which is great. Um, do they still barter? Uh, you can barter. You can especially barter on Saturdays. I mean, you have to, a lot of these things are really super discounted. Um, I don't really, you know, take to bartering when you first go to the market on Friday, but Saturday by the end of the day, sure, I think it would be, it would be okay. Uh, Rosamond, Rosamond says this was a fascinating program. Thank you. Pat says, I remember going to Haymarket many Saturday evenings. Uh, and she said a, a cup of slush was the best treat. This was back in the 60s. Uh, James says, thank you very much. Is Ruma still in business today? Um, you know, uh, before COVID, Ruma was still in business. And I believe they were located in Revere. I don't know, I have not checked recently, um, but they were in business. James, uh, let's see, Maddie says, wow, what an extraordinary story of the market situation in Boston. Thank you for this informative and interesting program. Uh, let me see, we've answered some of these questions. So Carol Lynn says, thank you for a great presentation. Uh, she has several questions. Uh, first, uh, what is the status of efforts to change the name of Faneuil Hall? But that's another <laughs> that's another talk. Um, that's a, you know, I, I all I can tell you about that is, and I think many of uh, the people in the audience have per probably heard what why that is because we do know that uh, Peter Faneuil was a slaveholder, uh, and I'm sure a lot of the people in the audience know you know, the controversy that's been going on for years now with removing Civil War statues to the Confederacy. Um, we are all coming to a reckoning with the past. I'm one who believes in telling a fuller story. That's what we talk about in my historic house class. Um, I think we have to talk about these stories. We have to talk about uh, Peter Fennell. Um, I can tell you that there are people on both sides of the argument, but I have heard of no um, current movement to rename that. I think there are still people who are lobbying for it. I met someone at a lecture last week who is adamantly against it. Uh, so it's, it's polarizing, um, but I do believe that that story needs to be told. I'm gonna ask a few more questions, Ken, and then we'll wrap up. 
Uh, Carol uh, Lynn also wants to know, did the system of assigning even numbers for licenses to residents and odd numbers to non-residents finally change? Yes, it did. Yes, um, it, it did in the 20th century, but I can't tell you, uh, I, I can't tell you exactly when. I think it had to do, I mean, why they were doing it is because, um, because of the new immigrants. And as people know, uh, there was uh, always, always has been prejudice against a lot of new immigrants coming into the country. Uh, there was prejudice against, you know, the Italians was prejudice against the Irish. Um, and that continues to this day. So that even in odd, I, I really think came about because it had to do with, with prejudice. Um, and that is gone now, so yes. Uh, and um, sort of segueing uh, Carol's last question, uh, when did Black residents of Boston start feeling comfortable enough to shop at Haymarket? Oh, it's a good question. I, I, I can't tell you exactly when. I mean, you, you saw that there were, um, in the images that I show, there were diverse people from all backgrounds. Um, I, I can't tell you when people were comfortable. Um, I can tell you that over the, what I, this, one thing I can tell you is that um, there are African-Americans working at the market and have been working at the market for quite a while. Um, I can tell you that one of the slides I showed you, I happen to mention that, you know, in the 60s, most of the vendors were Italian. Well, you saw from these other pictures that there are people from all countries now who are vendors, uh, Latinx. You saw Cambodians. There are actually several Cambodian uh, vendors down there. Um, and, you know, so it, it has changed. But I, I can't I can't say what. Uh, Grace uh, says, I walked by on a Friday recently and the layout seems to have changed a lot. Uh, has the hay market gotten smaller since the new hotel was built? Um, well, that actually is another good question. The number of spots have not changed. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, it may have been a smaller day um, when this person attended, because I've been down there when there are a few of the spots that are empty. Um, that's only really been since COVID. Um, so it, it, they do have the same number of spots. If you were there today when some people weren't there, uh, that's what happened. Anonymous attendee says, thanks for a great presentation, wonderful photos. Uh, Jody says, fabulous talk. I knew nothing about Haymarket and learned a lot. Looking forward to the videos on the Historic New England website, uh, on the Historic New England site. Thank you. Uh, Harvey says, I'm surprised by how much the market story of Boston mimics the current fresh markets in Loja, L-O-J-I, uh, Ecuador. And uh, let me see, there's a couple of questions in the q and I'm just going to ask one of them because we're pretty much out of time. Uh, Catherine asks, I'm curious, has a study been done on those shopping at the market and far away in the city they have come? For example, how, how large of an area does it draw on for attendance? Uh, you know, that's, a, gosh, these are some of the best questions I've ever had. Um, there have been, and I used in my research, excellent studies that people have done for their masters at Harvard and other universities that look at Haymarket. Um, I can tell you that you know, it, people come do come from the suburbs to the market. We know for a fact, for some people, it was just a tradition um, because I've talked to them. Many people came to for, uh, was stopping for pizza, which unfortunately that shop did close during COVID, uh, a real sad loss for the market. Um, I, 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 I can't tell you exactly. I, I don't have the figures on that, um, but I can tell you, I know for a fact that people still come from all over and I've met and I've interviewed them. I, I know people have come from as far as Quincy, um, I know people come from Stoneham. I know, you know, I don't know if anyone here goes from Tewksbury there, uh, but maybe put that in the chat if you did, uh, if you do.
uh, maybe some people here do. Yeah. Um, and uh, Patricia says, I walk through Haymarket all the time. I loved your talk. Thanks so much. So Ken, I think uh, we will wrap it there. We've gone uh, past the full hour. Um, folks, let's give uh, Ken another virtual round of applause and um, look for an email for those watching live. Look for an email from me later today with the recording, the feedback survey, and information about some other upcoming virtual programs that might be of interest. And uh, Ken, do you have any last words for the audience? I do. I, I want to two things. One is I want to say please support Haymarket. Um, we need it to continue for the reasons that I told you. It really serves a need in the city uh, for those most in need. And my last thing is uh, happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Thanks for having me. Yes, absolutely. Happy Thanksgiving and everyone have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.